Chipping away at the United Nations power grab, that is the topic of tonight's byline. The United Nations is huge, huge beyond my comprehension. Most people think of the General Assembly, the peacekeeping duties the UN performs, the diplomats that try and most often fail to stop war. They think of UNICEF, maybe they think of the humanitarian aid that goes out through the UN. But the organization is just huge. We've talked about this a bit lately, what with Scooter coming to Canada and telling us that we're all fat and have food insecurity, maybe because he wants to take away our bags of lays and have us adopt European socialism. I'm not quite sure. We've also talked about the UN chat shop made up of countries like China, a pillar of human rights, investigating Canada's human rights record when it comes to Omar Khadr. Then there was the lecture on refugees. Sure, we take in one of the highest rates of refugees in the world on a per capita basis, but because we won't accept people from the US or Britain any longer, we're big meanies. And of course, we've begun discussing the ridiculously sounding but absolutely real UN plan for land use control known as Agenda 21. And with all of that, we're just scratching the surface. I went over to the UN website and even knowing it was a huge organization, I was astounded at how many different bodies and groups and commissions that they have. The opening of the website was cute though. It shows a globe and several languages. It's, it's kind of a kumbaya moment looking at all that. And, and then you get, you know, this little slogan that says, United Nations, it's your world. Sounds like a tourism slogan, tourism slogan which is kind of appropriate because the UN has a tourism body to promote global tourism. It's now got Robert Mugabe as an ambassador. But look at all the organizations the UN has. A population fund, a world food program. Which is kind of weird because the population fund wants fewer people on the planet, but the world food program works real hard at keeping them all alive. Anyway, there's also a commission on social development, an international court, the Universal Postal Union. They even have a world weather office. In all manner of ways, the UN fancies itself as a government. Now, don't use the term world government, they don't like it, and it makes the people that say it, like me, look crazy, but look at their system. They have bodies for international social policy, industrial policy, health and agriculture. They even make laws. One of the laws they are trying, currently, trying to get moving is the Arms Trade Treaty. This is an attempt to start an international gun registry. You think the one we had in Canada was expensive? Wait until you hear about the global gun registry. And guess what? As with all things UN, Canada not only gets to pay its share, but as a developed country, if this passes, we'll get to pay for the system in poorer countries too. Here's part of a resolution that they have. By its resolution 6189, the General Assembly requested that the Secretary General to establish a group of governmental experts to examine the feasibility, scope, and draft parameters for a comprehensive, legally binding instrument establishing common international standards for the import, export, and transfer of conventional arms. Now, arms control in terms like conventional arms may sound spooky to some. It might remind you of Reagan and Gorbachev negotiating nuclear arms treaties in Iceland. Well, this ain't that. This is about rifles and shotguns and pistols, oh, and the ammunition that goes with each of them. This is about making sure that we stop the large-scale sale of small arms to thuggish regimes or the mob, but it's also about making it harder to import a Winchester from the U.S. to go hunting with. Think I'm joking? Last year, Canada tried to get sporting and hunting rifles excluded from the treaty, and the Harper government was blasted by the NDP and groups like Operation Plowshare. The United Nations is notoriously anti-gun, and I would not try to put it past them to use all kinds of regulations to make it harder to get guns, to make it unaffordable, not worth the hassle or the paperwork, the compliance costs. And remember, they view this treaty that they're working on as a legally binding document on all countries that sign it. Now in July, July of this year, gun control advocates from around the world will gather in New York to push for a tougher arms trade treaty through the UN. Canada needs to make sure that its sovereignty and the rights of law-abiding gun owners are protected. And that's the byline. Any gun owners in Canada hoping that the Harper government will protect them from the UN gun grabbers better think again. Not only has Canada gone along with much of this program so far, but we've got other problems in this country as well. The government that came to power after years of courting gun owners is 
now telling them they'll have to pay a fee to renew their licenses, one they never had to pay before. And perhaps more importantly, weeks after we first told you about the backdoor gun registry, that schlamozzle is still going on. Joining me now, Sun News reporter Daniel Prusilides, who's been following this story. Now, Daniel, I, we've heard from the government they don't want this going on. The prime minister's been clear he doesn't want this going on. We thought the commissioner of the RCMP was fairly clear, saying stop the backdoor gun registry. But it hasn't stopped in the provinces, has it? It hasn't stopped anywhere except in New Brunswick. New Brunswick is the one province that has made an announcement. Its chief firearms officer says, you know what, we'll fall into line that the, these paper ledgers, which really record the same information that was in the now abolished long gun registry, it's been abolished for almost two months now. Yeah. Uh, the, in New Brunswick, they say, that's fine, we're stopping this, this paper record of sales of unrestricted now, rifles and shotguns. Quebec, we always knew, wouldn't abide by this because they're challenging this in court and they want to keep it and they want to start their own provincial long gun registry. Uh, Ontario has been absolutely belligerent, but you'd expect that from Dalton McGinty uh, on, on this issue. And they've said, no, they're not going to stop this at all. But you would have thought that the provinces that had federally appointed chief firearms officers, these are RCMP officers appointed by the federal government in places like Saskatchewan, would have stood down. And, and what have you found out in calling them? Look, they, well, first of all, they don't like answering questions. Okay, like I can tell you that much. They a all... bureaucrat that yeah. wants power but doesn't want to answer questions. I, I'm shocked here, truly shocked. <laughs> they refer it Sorry. Back, to the, back to Ottawa, to the central RCMP offices, their communication shop, which really only communicates via email on this issue. But be that as it may, they won't answer one simple question. Which is? You know, which is, on, on May 10th, the RCMP commissioner sent a letter to every chief firearms officer across the country whether they're provincially or federally appointed, and said that Parliament has made clear that there's to be no form, not, not any form of a long gun registry. So I've asked the RCMP, does that mean that paper ledgers are a non-starter? This paper record that gun shops in Ontario and Manitoba and, and, and Saskatchewan and many of the Atlantic provinces still have, does that mean that that is a non-starter? The answer I got, I just got an answer today via email. The letter of the commissioner speaks for itself. That's the answer I but got. But apparently it doesn't. I apparently mean, I, it doesn't. I, I have heard conflicting reports of what's happening in Alberta. To be honest, I've been told yeah. by, by some that it's not happening, by others it is. But Saskatchewan, where the premier, I'm told, doesn't want this happening, this is still happening. So the provincial government doesn't want it, the federal government doesn't want it, and yet you've got a rogue bureaucrat. So that's all the RCMP is willing to say to you is the letter speaks for itself, but they can't explain why this is still happening? Look, the RCMP sent this letter on May the 10th. Now, uh, in the weeks after that, I have been trying to get an answer from the Mounties on what the letter means. Does it mean that paper ledgers are a non-starter? They won't answer that question. They will just quote back parts of the letter. They'll say, uh, you know, the, the letter speaks for itself, so on and so forth. But will they answer even a simple yes or no? Are paper ledgers legit? Yes or no? Can't get an answer. All right. We'll keep trying to get answers. Daniel, thanks so much.